7.38 p.m. My name is Judd Pierce, and I am the chair of this fine committee. Um, before we get started tonight, uh, I'd like to just have a request, respectfully, a brief moment of silence for the passing of Harry McCabe. Mm. Uh, Mr. McCabe was um, just a long time <laughs> member of town meeting, beloved husband, father, an Arlington treasure that many, many, many folks are going to miss. Um, we lost Harry this week, so uh, respectfully, a moment of silence for Mr. McCabe. Thank you. Tonight, um, we're going to start off with um, a bit from Dr. Bodhi on a special education director and a recommendation of that position to us. We will move on to programmatic needs of the Arlington High School, which will be a discussion led by Dr. Bode, as well as an architect at HMFH, Lori Coles. And then we'll have some brief presentations of new policies and first read policies from the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee. And we will follow with a brief executive session uh, coming out, I think, mm -hmm. only for adjournment purposes. So without right. any further ado, Dr. Yes. Bode. Yes, I, I am very pleased to introduce to you and recommend the appointment of Allison Elmer as the Director of Special Education for next year. And Allison, would you like to join us up here at the table? As you're aware, we began this process back in, Nove really, November, in which we started posting for the position. Um, we had a search committee that was very representative of teachers, administrators, um, CPAC, parents in the community, and we, inter we had a number of candidates that we interviewed and uh, have had actually a, a, a fairly long series of um, multiple interviews here in the district as well as um, considerable reference checks, which is, which is something that I firmly believe is important. And uh, through this process, um, I have come to the, the um, the place where I want to recommend um, Ms. Elmer to you. I'm going to let her talk a little bit about her background, but I will say to you this in terms of her educational background. Uh, she holds an MED from Harvard in school leadership, and uh, her bachelor's from Boston College is in um, moderate and, and uh, severe special needs. So without that, I'm, what, what, what our plan is this evening is that um, um, Allison is going to give a little bit of background um, about herself, and then we thought that the, ma the majority of the time would be an opportunity for you to ask some questions. Uh, procedurally, we will have an executive session tonight. We will we'll talk, ab talk about some contractual issues and then a vote on the appointment and the contract will be next week. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Hi. It's nice to meet everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, as Dr. Bodie said, um, I actually have elementary and moderate special needs, not elementary. severe special needs um, mm -hmm. as an undergraduate. But um, I started working out as a classroom teacher at a uh, nonprofit uh, Chapter 766 approved private school for um, students with autism. I worked with the 16 to 22 year olds in the vocational training program at the League School of Greater Boston. Uh, originally at the time it was over in uh, Newton and has since moved out to Walpole. Um, and after doing that for a couple of years, I went back to graduate school to get uh, my master's in school leadership. And through that, I did a internship in the Boston Public Schools um, for my principal licensure. And through that, um, ended up working in the Boston uh, Public Schools for the next seven years as what was called a lab cluster coordinator, which is a special ed administrator for a program for students identified with social and emotional uh, disabilities. And then I most recently um, currently working in the Reading Public Schools as the Director of Student Services there. And I met several of you throughout the interview process. And one of the things I'm really excited about um, coming to Arlington is that blend of both my urban background and now this more um, suburban experience, but blending that in a community that really truly is diverse, both economically as well as ethnically and racially and, and having that blend is something that is really exciting to me but also the fact that you're a high achieving district with those um, what can sometimes be seen as challenges for some communities it's 
it's great to be joining a community that has really been able to provide quality education for a variety of students um, across across those demographics. So that's something I'm really excited about, as well as the staff that I've had the opportunity to meet, um, particularly the special education uh, <coughs> leadership, the coordinators, and that look like a strong group who have a lot of ideas about where they'd like to see the district go, and they have a vast experience. Uh, so I'm really excited about working with that group of people, as well as the central office team that I had the opportunity to meet, and I'm very excited. Open it up for questions, I guess, from the committee, and we'd like to we'd like to start. Mr. Hayter, <laughs> can you tell us anything, uh, some stuff about uh, programs that you've initiated uh, in district, not a district? Sure. Um, most recently in in Reading, when I came to the district, we had identified students who we had a program for kids with social and emotional issues, but we had identified a group that still was not responding to those uh, supports and chronic school avoidance, um, repeated hospitalizations. And so within my first year, we had put together a program for those students, which we call a therapeutic support program. Um, we worked with, uh, with DECO's Children's Services as the consultant to help us develop that program. It's now in its, mm -hmm. well, we're in our third year now of the program. And we continue to work on refining the program, but through that process, of developing it we've then looked at our other existing programs to how can we how can we look at them to match what the current population is in the programs we you know in the last six to eight years we really spent a lot of time developing programs but the profile of the students has changed and so we need to make sure that we're continually looking at our programs to make sure they're meeting the needs of the students that we currently have, not who maybe we started the program for eight years ago. So we're doing that and we're um, working with, um, as I mentioned, the consultants to kind of go program by program right now. So that's some of the experience I've had doing that. Thank you. Ms. Hyde? As you get familiar with the district, you'll, I'm sure, have a laundry list of things that you'd like to look in more detail at. But in terms of your overall um, exposure to special ed and mm -hmm. the direction of districts right now, is there anything that you see could be an area for focus that would lead us to be on the forefront or, stand, or setting the standard for special education as opposed to being reactionary to um, mm -hmm. what we see as our perceived population? Right, so I, I think that that question really starts in general education, and so what are we doing to serve all students before they get to special ed, so that we aren't just waiting until they've we have their needs haven't been met in that setting. And so, I think, or a lot of districts are familiar with RTI. And I know that you've done a lot with <coughs> reading interventions here, um, but I do think uh, my particular. Um, passion is for behavioral health as well, and so that's an area that I really do think that if we start to look at the tiered interventions for behavioral health supports and the way that we look at tiered interventions for academics is a way to, to, to be moving forward. The state has developed, you know, they have created their own department of MTSS, um, and it's still in the beginning stages. And so I do think that that's an area for growth and opportunity to really be leaders in it. They've started introducing grants for, for uh, districts that are exploring that, and I think that's an area we could definitely be leaders. <clears throat> like many districts, we've seen a significant increase in, health, in uh, special education costs over the past five years. Um, and it, it's, it's questionable whether we can sustain that level of growth. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you've given any thought to how you might address that challenge. I think we need to look deeper into where is the where is the growth coming from? Is it from increasing out of district placements? Is it the growth in the the cost of our in district programs? So that first question, you know, exploring that, I I think the stronger we make our in district programs, the less we need to look at out of district programs. Um, so an area to really dig into is what are our our programs and. Are they meeting the needs of the students in the way that, that we need them to? Um, Dr. Bodie has mentioned that that's something that you've already started to look at, and it's something that you want to continue. And, and whether the current staffing structures support what 
the program is designed to do or, yeah. or whether it's shifted and there's been some drift and, and how do you get back to what was intended, but that would be an area that I would. Ms. Starks. Um, the, when I talk to parents um, in our, who are being served by our special education department, the number one issue that they say we have is customer service. Mm -hmm. um, they tell us that uh, they, there are things they don't know, there are calls that aren't made back in time, whatever. Um, I want to know what you think you could do and what you think we could do about fixing that. Sure. So uh, some of it might be as simple as I don't, and this would be something um, I would need to find out, is, you know, do we have either whether a ex uh, explicit policy or an unexpected policy around simply returning, you know, communication, whether it's within 48 hours on a phone call or 24 hours within email. I, I, I think something as simple as setting those expectations is, is one way to start. But um, I've mentioned in previous um, interviews, I think making sure that everybody has the same information so that you're building trust so that you know that when you speak to the teacher that it's going to be the same message that you get from the building principal, which is going to be the same message that you get from the coordinator or the team chair or the director. I think that helps to build trust so that maybe the I need to get an answer from someone else isn't always there. Um, I think customer service is a delicate balance because you know, in a business setting, yes, the customer is always right, but when we're working in schools, we're more of a team, and so we have to respect both what the educators are, are bringing to the table and what the family is bringing to the table. So having that mutual respect and understanding for what each, what, it, what is driving each side. So understanding that as a, when a parent comes in, they're concerned about their child. As a teacher, you may be concerned about your classroom. As a principal, you're concerned about your school. And how do we keep, bring all those lenses to meet the needs of that individual child, but also within a district that we have to keep in mind, too? So I think those are frank conversations you have to be able to have. And by being honest and being truthful, you get to a place where, you know, it, it's not about, well, you want that and we want this. but. These are, these are what we're, bring, we're all bringing to the table, and we at least have to recognize that. And so I, I think that's part of, you know, being heard, and, and uh, that's part of customer service, you know? You don't want to just call to the next answer. Well, I didn't like that answer, so I'm going to call and hope someone else gives me a different answer. I, I think that doesn't build trust, and it just creates that continued need for more and more um, phone calls. So I, I would start with making sure that we all have the same we are all armed with the same knowledge and information so that we can, it was a long answer for a short question, but. It's a good answer. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, uh, for me, the difficult question is this. You're like, you, you did the principal internship, but you're going in this, this, in this direction. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to be a special ed director? Do you know, when I went to graduate school, they didn't have the SPED director's program. <laughs> so uh, it was, uh, you know, if I was going to get licensure, then it would be in a principal licensure, so at least mm -hmm. I could be an administrator in a building. I'd always wanted to be a special ed administrator. Uh, mm -hmm. To be honest, I never had any intentions of being mm -hmm. a principal. It was, but to get that administrative experience, um, you know, and when I was a school-based administrator, that was really helpful to have that much bigger picture. A lot of times Times, I think, particularly with a, with a special ed director, you, you know, you've identified a, a strong special ed teacher, and they might become a team chair, and then they become, and they don't have that experience with school leadership and the bigger mm -hmm. picture of organizational um, leadership. So, I, you know, I'm really glad that I had that experience, um, but it was never my intention to be a principal. I, I see your experience as a former Boston person myself. I see your experience as a lab cluster coordinator. And for those who don't understand what a difficult and challenging job that is, could you just give a brief description of what sure. that's about? Sure. So the lab, the, at the time, the acronym was Learning Adaptive Behavior, mm -hmm. and I mentioned it was for mm -hmm. students identified with social and emotional disabilities. Um, it was a substantially separate program within mm -hmm. the, um, you know, general ed. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a K to five, and then we became a K to eight, mm -hmm. um, and. It's for students who have exhibited traditionally uh, more of the um, 
externalizing behaviors rather than the internalizing mm -hmm. behaviors. So more of the acting out, um, physical, mm -hmm. verbal aggression. Um, I think that mm -hmm. with people who worked <laughs> in Boston are probably more familiar with that aspect mm -hmm. of the program. But I think what's important to understand is the root of those behaviors mm -hmm. are the same thing that might be an internalizing. So whether it's anxiety, depression, a trauma history, mm -hmm. it, how it's exhibited is you know maybe mm -hmm. different than a kid who turns inward and mm -hmm. create you know self harm or self injurious <coughs> behaviors. Mm -hmm. So that understanding um, I think is what also you know keeps me so why behavioral health is so important to me, but also just that notion that these kids belong in our schools. So that's the one group mm -hmm. that I think people have one of the most difficult times accepting as that's a disability. Are they just bad kids? Are they just mm -hmm. willfully you know, misbehaving and they don't see the disability because maybe it's not physical, it doesn't look physical, you know, their test scores aren't showing that they have a cognitive delay, they can't see it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think mm -hmm. that understanding and that experience um, has mm -hmm. been really, mm -hmm. really funda fundamental to what I do now. Thank you. Anyone else? Dr. Allison um, So I'm thinking back to what you were saying that each parent feels you know, they're concerned about their child and yet as an administrator you're having to look at kind of the whole picture and I'm just wondering if you could give an example of how you've kept the best interests of the children in mind as you've made bigger picture decisions. Sure. I, I mean, those decisions are still at the heart of what we're doing at the end of the day when it comes down to, and this may go back to, you know, special ed expenses, at the end of the day, we're still going to be driven by, you know, what is right for the child and, you know, a free appropriate education in a the least restrictive environment and, you know, um, I, I think of, we've had a couple of students where we've identified uh, that we feel that they would be best supported in a substantially separate program. Mm -hmm. um, the parent really want, you know, valued inclusion and wanted their child to be inclu included um, to the maximum extent, you know, that they could. And so that really caused us to think about how we would shift support so that student could be included um, mm -hmm. in a meaningful way so that that student could mm -hmm. um, still benefit from instruction um, and so it, it was several hard conversations with a family of saying you want this for your child in order for them to receive this we're going to have to make some compromises and um, we've been able to do that by building supports and at the school that normally we would have said you have to go across town to that school and to that program over there how can we look at starting to build some of those resources in here so the student can stay in their home school and that was a bigger shift it was a shift in resources it was a shift in thinking for the school itself how are we going to these are kids that we would normally have referred elsewhere and so it's it's taken a couple of years for there to be kind of that ownership and to say the student is here to stay. Um, but that was something that it felt top down, <laughs> you know, that we were, this is going to happen. You're going to have to do it, but how can we support you so that you can support the student? And, you know, the family has been excellent. They've been a partner in it and they recognize that the school is still learning, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and we're trying to support the teachers as they learn. So I think that's one example. Great, thank you. Thank you for being here tonight and to speak with us. And um, in meeting with you a few weeks ago, I remembered a question uh, about the increase or the uptick in student anxiety and what um, that holds, what that beholds for a department such as our special education department. If you were the director here, how would you address that sort of broad issue? Sure. Well, you also have a pretty um, big, a, a pretty large department as well between your school psychologist and the social workers and the behavior support. So I, I really see that as, that group is helping to um, really drive what we do. But I do think it goes back to looking at a structure that is not just about special ed again, but what's is about the whole school and, and how do we use a multi-tiered system of support to intervene early um, and how do we use it to you know lay that foundation for all students and then how what how do we identify students who need a little bit more and then for those kids who 
really, you know, are going to need some individual stuff. But using that lens, again, um, that we, we are all comfortable using for academics, but using that lens on a behavioral health um, perspective, such as anxiety, um, and, you know, and depression is another one that is also, um, we're, seeing, we're seeing increases in as well. Um, but using that lens to think about all students and not, again, just waiting till they get to special ed to address the problem, but really looking at it as this is a problem for the whole school and the whole system to address. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, question? Any, any I don't know if anybody else has to. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. No? Thank you. Thank you very much for, right, for being you. here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Okay, moving on with our agenda, we are at the programmatic needs report of the Arlington High School. This will be a 60-minute segment, folks, for watching. Uh, before we get started, Linda Hansen, our AEA rep, is with us here tonight. Good evening, Linda. Um, okay, so. Uh, um, I just had a text from our presenter, and she's been held up with some traffic getting in here. Okay. So could I suggest that we perhaps Flip the. Um, yeah. the we don't want to be, I think she's just going to be a couple more minutes. Motion. Um, motion to table um, the programmatic needs report. Second. Okay. Discussion. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 All those against? Okay. Moving on then to our nine o'clock segment: policies and procedures. Sorry to put you on the hot seat <coughs> a little earlier than usual. Okay. Mr. Thielman. He's always ready. I'm ready. <laughs> ready for some second reads. Ready for second reads. Okay. So we have a second reading of a new policy, KEB, public complaints. And at the same time, we would be eliminating, it would be replacing uh, KE, current version of public complaints, KE-E, -E, another ver another ex uh, the explanation of public complaints, KEB, Public complaints about school personnel and KEB dash R um, the, uh, the procedure uh, regarding public complaints about school personnel. And so, uh, as we discussed last week, the purpose of this is to simplify the complaint process, to make it clear that the first uh, line of complaint is to a the staff member with whom you have a d disagreement, the second is to the building principal, the third is to the superintendent or de designee, and the final place to go is to the school committee. Um, so it simplifies the process, and according to our lawyers, it um, limits our liability. Okay. Um, can I entertain a motion? So I, I move that we have, uh, adopt policy KEB and uh, eliminate policies, the, the policies I indicated, KE, KE-E, KEB, KEB-R. Second. Second by Ms. Starks. <coughs> Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Passes. Uh, the next is um, <coughs> The second reading of the elimination of policies which are no longer necessary or are obsolete by, uh, because of mm -hmm. regulation or law. Uh, policy H, negotiations. Policy HG, the method of determining staff negotiating organizations. And policy mm -hmm. JFABA, the kindergarten fee policy. Mm -hmm. We don't need these policies anymore because of contracts we have with, with our union mm -hmm. unions and because we don't have the, the fee policy. We don't have a kindergarten fee. Mm -hmm. I move elimination of these policies. Second. Just one thing on uh, file um, HG. It does recognize the Arlington Education Association as the one that the school committee recognizes. Um, and it describes Unit A of AEA and AAA. And do you have um, any reasons why we wouldn't want that noted in our policy manual? For Future reference? Mr. Ann? It's already, uh, we're contractually bound because it's part of the recognition clause in each one of the contracts. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I personally don't see it necessary in policy. Uh, the contract would supersede policy mm -hmm. anyway. Same point. Mm -hmm. So this, this sort of it's redundant, is yeah. in the contract. Yeah. It's in the contract. In the redundant. recognition clause. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone? No? No one? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? That passes 7 0. Okay, then the next is just the first reading uh, tonight of elimination of two other policies which are no longer necessary because of the adoption of KEB, which is escalating issues, BEDHA, mm -hmm. and staff complaints and grievances. Staff complaints and grievances are, is actually covered by contract, mm -hmm. and that's policy uh, GBK. So mm -hmm. tonight's just the first reading, and the committee's happy to answer any questions that people might have. Any questions mm -hmm. on these first reads? <coughs> okay. The committee meets next on Tuesday, March 18th at um, 6.30. 6 6.30 p.m., right, mm -hmm. 6.30 p.m. And <clears throat> at that meeting, mm -hmm. uh, we, we had a conversation. Mm -hmm. You can see in the minutes when you read the minutes. We had a conversation about the district's policies on discrimination and harassment. And mm -hmm. Attorney Bryan is recommending um, that we update those policies and make them current with uh, the law. And we had a discussion about that at the, at the last meeting. She took our input. She's going to come back with some modifications on the 18th. She's also going to have some other uh, potential changes So uh, regarding, regarding curriculum. So we will come back to you uh, at the last meeting in, uh, of the year, uh, your last meeting as chair, on March 27th with some first readings. And a second, well, I guess next week we do the second reading of these policies. Great. So you would, if, if you're absent next meeting, are you comfortable having this? Second reading, just to be second, second reading. reading. We have no first readings because we'll, we're we can't meet until the next, until mm -hmm. the 18th. Right. Okay. That's it. 13th or the 11th? 13th. The, the, the school committee meeting? No, March 18th. Oh, subcommittee meeting. Yeah, subcommittee oh, meeting. Sub, sorry, I'm sorry. It's March 18th. Mm -hmm. No, March 18th, subcommittee meeting, 6.30 p.m. In the superintendent's office. Nothing from policies at our next meeting. Okay. No, well, second reading of these yeah. things. That's okay. it. That's it. Great. All right. Anything else for policies and procedures? Any other subcommittee reports? No? Okay. <laughs> Moving on. We have a special guest in the house. Laurie Seale. And no, Ms. Heim. Motion to remove programmatic needs report of the Arlington High School from the table. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Okay, moving on then to um, programmatic needs report of the Arlington High School. If I might invite to the table Miss um, Lori Coles, architect mm -hmm. of the firm of HMFH mm -hmm. in Cambridge. Well, well we're getting the, um, <coughs> the presentation set up. Let me just give you a little background of where we are in this process. I know there's been a lot of discussion over this year, in fact, last year as well, in terms of what are the facility needs of this district and very specifically the facility needs of Arlington High School. Mm -hmm. um, as you are well aware of, when we went through the accreditation process, um, <coughs> while the uh, New England Association of college, Schools and Colleges were very um, laudatory about what was going on in the building educationally, they were also expressed concern about the facilities and how the, mm -hmm. that the, the, the building itself um, were not aligned with really the, the level of teaching that was going on and, and perhaps even prevented uh, teachers from doing more than that they could just because of the, some of the constraints. As a result of that, um, the NEASC mm -hmm. has placed the high school on a warning status, which means that over the next 10 years, because mm -hmm. accreditation happens every 10 years, there's, during that period of time there'll be um, reports that are need to be made, but at the end of those 10 years when we are, are again looking at accreditation, mm -hmm. uh, without any kind of movement forward on that issue, it does um, present the possibility I'm not saying it would, uh, definitively, but the possibility of not being accredited because mm -hmm. of facilities. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one aspect of this. Um, last year, we also mm -hmm. had um, a report done on the, from the engineering firm, mm -hmm. Onsite Insight, about what the mechanical and engineering needs 
of the district uh, of the school are and that report you have it at your place it's also for those watching this evening that report is on the district website in fact if you mm -hmm. go to the district website and you look on the right hand side you'll see AHS facilities documents and opening that up you will come to the reports and as we go through this process the report this evening will be put up there and we'll mm -hmm. just keep people apprised of any documentation mm -hmm. that is relevant um, to what we are mm -hmm. what we are going to need to do for this mm -hmm. high school in, in future years but that's a quick little background but now that Lori's got her presentation up there, mm -hmm. let me introduce Lori a little more formally mm -hmm. um, I Lori um, has the distinction of being the architect that designed the new Thompson Elementary School. And we all know how proud we are of that building. It's really a beautiful building. And, and mm -hmm. besides the fact that this building uh, is beautiful, mm -hmm. very colorful, it is also was on actually under budget and on time. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if there's any other building, elementary building that was for that size <coughs> that came in at that price tag, either of 20 million. It was really quite, um, mm -hmm. quite an effort on the part of HMFH to make sure that we were getting a high quality building at mm -hmm. the same time met the budget that we had for the building. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Wanna, mm -hmm. this is an opportunity to also again publicly thank mm -hmm. Lori and her thank firm, you. which, was, which is a, it's, it's a great group of people that work together quite well. And, and really were very helpful mm -hmm. to us all. And you were a good group to work with. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> it was a great committee, mm -hmm. I have to say. So when we are looking at where we are here, we, we've, we have the NEASC um, accreditation <coughs> issues, but we also have looked at this building from the mm -hmm. point of view of infrastructure. Arlington High School has not had a major renovation since the late 1970s. In fact, I think it was 1978. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that there haven't been repairs um, over in the building. In fact, in the last few years, we've re had to replace two of the six boilers. Mm -hmm. So there's been different things, there's that, that ha but it's always been responsive to a particular need or a problem or emergency or whatever that these, these, these needs have been met. So while we have the infrastructure, we were looking to, to take another lens at this building, and that is what are the programmatic needs of the building? In, in other words, in what ways does the building constrain teaching and learning? Or what things mm -hmm. could we be doing better if we had an improved mm -hmm. facility? Mm -hmm. And so it was to that end that we hired the firm of HMFH to do a programmatic review um, of the high school, and um, that's what you're here tonight to hear. So, Lori's going to give the presentation, and I'm hoping that we'll follow with a, a lot of uh, lively questions. Uh, Lori, let me turn this over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Is that close enough to this? I hope. Um, so, we've structured it around um, the following topics, just an overview of the school. I know all of you have been there multiple, multiple times over the years, so not too much detail. Um, and getting into the more of the, the meat of the topic, which is the programmatic study, um, uh, which also includes a whole piece about safety and security. Mm -hmm. um, a, brief, a brief discussion about the facility condition, and then um, another sort of brief outline of where um, the school department sees the enrollments and projections going. And, you know, all of those things tie into the need. Um, whether you're out of room or the, the roof needs to be replaced, all of them mm -hmm. add up to um, the level of need of the school. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I know you all are very familiar, um, and mm -hmm. I'm learning all the, the, the lingo. So our oldest building is this piece over here, um, which is the Fusco House, and it's 100 years old this year. <laughs> And so I'll stop there and say we all know that in the last hundred years education has changed quite a bit. Then, um, and it's uh, hard to know exactly, but the, the front whole piece here is referred to as Column House, and that was in the 1930s. And I'll admit, I was one of the same people who also thought that was the older piece. I mean, it's just so distinctive and front. Mm -hmm. um, and then, obviously, I've learned differently. Mm -hmm. But again, 1930s was. 80, almost 80 years ago, 
education has changed a lot. And then the last pieces came in in the back here referred to as Downs House, and that was in the 60s. As Kathy referred to, um, there was uh, some work done in the 70s, um, you know, again, more renovation type work. But the major pieces are those components there. And it's even interesting looking at from an aerial sort of the, the conditions of the different roofs. You can tell when one was replaced, you know, things like that. It's, a, it's all right there in the picture. And again, just for orientation for anybody, uh, the, the Mass Ave is down the bottom of the page, and all of your fields are at the top of the page. Um, it's a very big complex that's close to 400,000 square feet, mm -hmm. which I would say is one of the biggest um, high schools in our state. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of terrain for the kids to cross through and pass every day, so we'll talk about that. Um, the building being that large, it's not fully occupied by the high school. Um, over the years, different programs have morphed and changed, um, and other, other um, spaces have been um, added to the building. Mm -hmm. So um, this tried to graphically show all of the floor plans. So there's, there's seven levels, uh, excuse me, six levels to the building. And um, as you all are probably very aware, we're in one of those spots right now. And that is that the school administration is in part of the high school. There's also a preschool program that takes over several areas of the high school. Um, that's at the, the lower level, oopsie, wrong button. The lower level in blue down here is all the preschool program. There are town offices mm -hmm. here. There's uh, district, school district-wide and town-wide storage use facilities here. Um, there is uh, a lab collaborative program. And again, speaking to all of the school committee, you all know what that is for. And that, and that actually holds uh, a pretty good chunk of the space right here. And the other thing that I'd like to point out, a lot of the building is underground, let's just say. And so, for instance, when you're looking at this, this main facade of the building here on what's called the first floor, everything that's under here has no windows. It's underground. It's under the building. And so back in the day, when something like this block right here, which is almost 8,000 square feet, was a auto, you know, woodworking, metalworking shop, you know, all of that kind of stuff, no one really minded them being without windows. And, and they were an elective, and you sort of came and went out of those spaces. And nowadays, there's sort of requirements for natural light for, you know, fully occupied classroom spaces. So, so it, it is interesting to sort of take that almost 400,000 square feet and start to think about how it's really being used right now. Um, it's not to say that if all of those other functions could go somewhere else, how would the high school use it? I mean, these are all questions to be asked and answered as the study goes on in the future. But it is interesting to think about how the building is being used and broken up. And there's a lot of little, little green dots here and there which are, um, again, district-wide office spaces. So we sort of divided up the report, and I know you've all had it, and hopefully I've had a chance to at least give it a, a, a first review um, into the following categories to try to, to, to grapple with the different types of programmatic needs that you may have. Um, so size and configuration, quantity and quality of the spaces, the technology and other types of needs, um, adjacencies and size and um, just overall space needs. So sometimes people say, well, I need one more of this classroom space, and that's, that's sort of that idea. But all of these sort of come together to make a functioning school building. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get it right, you know you have it right, and everything flows and works very well. So, um, and this is just a graphic that says this is the high school's use of the space. And it's just divided up, color-coded, between academic, shared use spaces, and support spaces. And one thing that I think is a little hard to see on here, but we'll talk a little bit more about it, um, we've put little uh, dark asterisks on a lot of rooms where, in fact, um, we call them the obstructed view rooms. So they've been highlighted and marked on here. Again, it's in your handout um, <coughs> for the more specifics, and we'll talk about them in a moment. So looking at, um, did I go the right direction? Yeah. So. <coughs> Looking at the first piece, size and configuration. So this gets back to the fact that this is a very large school building. And 
inherently in a large building that means that you know kids have to get from one point to another and that's that can take some time and you only have a couple minutes between classes mm -hmm. so I always like to look at thinking about a student who has to get from the the fifth mm -hmm. floor of Fusco where the <coughs> um, world languages are Mm -hmm. um, all the way down and out and through and out to a further corner of downs for their math class. Mm -hmm. And so I'm assuming at some point they're, they're almost running. And I'm also assuming, and I've seen it, um, a lot if it works that way, depending on where they're going from A to B, they cut through that library space, if anyone's ever witnessed that as well. Mm -hmm. Really disruptive for the library. I mean, the library um, feels less like a space and more like a pass through a lot of the day. Um, so what this is also showing all in blue is all the circulation. So again, because of its size, because of the three different iterations plus other you know, changes over the years, um, we counted, and I'm not kidding, you have 20 flights, full on flights sets of stairs in this building. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we also did a rough takeoff on the computer over 5,700 linear feet of corridors. Mm. It's a lot. <laughs> and again, there are big high schools, but this is definitely one of them. And it, it adds to sort of the complexity of the, of the, mm -hmm. of the project and, and of the school day. Um, so that's, that's really the highlight of what we're trying to show here is really how much of this building is taken up by circulation how much of the building is currently mm -hmm. taken up by other program use. And mm -hmm. again, in rough numbers, you know, the actual academic space mm -hmm. being used by the high school is something just over 200,000. And mm -hmm. it's spread out. So you've got you know, 200,000 worth of net program mm -hmm. space in a 400,000 square foot mm -hmm. bucket, you know, and so it's really spread out. And again, that's where you see sort of the, um, the needs of uh, organizing the building, mm -hmm. um, making it a clear and understandable building for the students. Um, I mean, I, I'll be honest, you know, I had floor plans in my hand. Mm -hmm. I was walking around with the superintendent, with the high school principal. Mm -hmm. I'm an architect. I understand floor plans. And I was completely turned around. I'm like, where the, where, okay, oh, okay, so we're over here. And then mm -hmm. at some point they said, okay, we're, we're going this way now, and you have to go, okay, how do I get that way? I mean, mm -hmm. and granted, over time, these kids know what they're doing. They all, they all figure it out, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And um, I witnessed another individual, which you all know, who came in for a meeting. I'm sure he's been in this meeting and building a million times. And he's like, how do I get there? He was even asking, so I felt a little better. So it is, it is a complex building to, na to navigate for uh, visitors and students alike. Um, the next, uh, another thing I just uh, briefly want to touch on, you have to imagine that, you know, annually you're paying to maintain this building, mm -hmm. whether it's cleaning on the daily, weekly basis, or mm -hmm. the energy, you know, efficiency of the building and paying for the mm -hmm. lights and the heat. And so there's just a level of inefficiency with the overall mass of the building if it's not being fully utilized in an effective way. So again, that's something that would get more into detail as you move forward in your process to really learn what that's all about. Um, so quantity and quality. So quantity, I think everyone would, would understand, just sort of saying that you have X number of science room, in fact, you really need more of those. So that, that's something that's, that's easy to um, mm -hmm. put your hands on. But then when you start thinking about the quality of the spaces, um, so uh, you see in three, three of these rooms, um, the three different <laughs> classrooms, they're showing the example of when there's a freestanding structural column in the Scary. middle of the space. Um, you know, what is happening in these rooms, if you look on the upper left, um, I don't know what that little floating box is, but that's okay. What's happening in these rooms is because the column is here, Mm -hmm. and the teaching wall is behind there, you see a big gap of nothing because no one can actually sit there. And so all the kids are either smushed over to one side of the room mm -hmm. or over to the other side of the room. And we've, you know, I spoke to a number of the teachers, and even then it's a little bit of, <laughs> you know, hap both for the instructor as well as the students. Mm -hmm. And, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if you can really tell from, from looking at these, the students' desks are 
you know, all but right on top of each other. I mean, I, I would imagine that in a lot of cases they sort of have to move the desk, get in, move the desk back. Again, it's because, you know, the size of the room is what it is, but it's not all usable and it's not all functional. Um, this room here down, down in the lower left is a science classroom, and we'll talk more about that later, about just um, having a cramped space where you're using chemicals and all of that is, uh, you know, there's, there's studies about how that's a bad idea. And then this room, um, the teacher's very creative and she has it working very well for herself, but the room is triangular in shape. And so she found that for, for what she was teaching and how she was teaching, she, she has all of the kids along the perimeter and then she's got a, a little group table in the middle. But again, all the kids, when they come in, they sort of have to move their chair and get to that spot. And, and it's working for her, but it's certainly not ideal. I think anyone, would, uh, we've all been in classrooms. We were, all, we were all taught in classrooms. We don't have to be teachers to know that this is, this is a little tricky. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple percentages and things like that to, to talk about that are in the report. Um, what we did as an initial sort of understanding is we compared sizes of spaces in the, the high school here with what the MSBA space guidelines are today for high schools. And um, in fact, only 23% of the general classrooms at Arlington High School meet the minimum requirement of what MSBA would recommend that your general classroom should be. Mm -hmm. um, and then on a separate note, the science rooms, which mm -hmm. we're just sort of touching on how they're cramped, the science classrooms on average are about 1,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. MSBA's recommended high school science classroom is 1,440 square feet. Mm -hmm. So we already, that already says, okay, they're, they're under the size. Layer on the fact that MSBA guidelines assume a class of 23 students. And the majority of the high school science classrooms are anywhere from 28 to 30. So the room is smaller, there's more kids in the room, and let alone the obstructions, but what it's, what it's creating, and again, having heard from the science teachers, you know, it, it creates, um, they, they literally have to make a decision, can I do this experiment the way I would like to do this experiment with mm. all the students hands-on and doing what they, what I would want them to be doing, or in fact, have I, you know, this is an unsafe situation. We're not going to do it that way, and they'll do a different something else. I mean, it, you know, the education is happening. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, they'll they'll do the experiment up in front of the class for the whole mm -hmm. class to see, and, and so on. But um, it sort of is is uh, stymies hands-on learning, um, and and what you'd like to see happen. Um, and then, uh, again, referencing that previous slide, all the asterisks, um, just taking all of your classrooms, 20% of the current classrooms have some form of obstruction or mm -hmm. a regular shape or, you know, and, and different things like that that <coughs> sort of um, hinder um, the teaching and learning mm -hmm. process. Um, the, the next slide is, um, I've called it technology and other necessary features, um, you know, things like, you know, power <laughs> and data and wireless <laughs> and water and uh, updated equipment. So just to, and again, if you saw how many pictures I went through today, I'm not even sure who ran around the building and took these pictures. It was credit to Dave Moore, who, oh. uh, who teaches photography in the school. Well, per a perfect person. <laughs> so, um, but I had a whole, whole uh, slew of pictures to choose from. But um, what I've got on the upper left is um, science room. And so this here is the fume hood. In this area here, you can just see uh, it's kind of chipped and broken, the shower head and the eyewash. Mm. Um, I'm going to assume that it all works, <laughs> but I can tell you, having you know, done a number of high schools in recent years, that it's pretty antiquated equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at things like just you know, built-in equipment and having it being updated. This picture speaks for itself. <laughs> you have wires going up the wall and down and around, you have something trying to keep the wires on the floor so no one trips over them and around. Um, this, is, this is common. 
And the other thing that I, he didn't get a picture of, but that's also equally as common, is just is teachers using extension cords, mm -hmm. straight, and you know taping them down as, as best they can and everything <coughs> again to get everything they need to plugged in. Um, an inherent problem with the building in its structure, which you know who would have known this 80 years ago? Um, it's so solidly built that it's hard to use or make use of wireless um, technology. And so it doesn't mean you can't do it, but it means that you would need multiples and multiples of wireless locations because you can't span through all that masonry. Um, and they've been trying and then looking at different ways of doing this um, in the building, but it, it is difficult. It's not impossible, it's just a more costly way because of having to, to do what you, ha what you have to do. Um, so now this is another one that might be a little hard to see. So the upper right is also a science room. And I was actually there the day when, um, after the weekend, when this teacher was very pleased with himself because he has figured out a way, and I want to say it politely, Jerry Rig, um, the, the ceiling mounted projector in his room. Mm -hmm. And so he went home and over the weekend he built a plywood platform that he could mount it on and hang it from the ceiling and you can see the wires coming across to <coughs> get to where they need to go. Um, a close of it, it's, it's quite a little um, work of art. And so it, there's just been problems with, um, again, the structure. In some rooms there's the waffle ceiling, it makes it hard to mount things on. There's no power there, so again, you have to be creative because you gotta get the power to where you want it to be able to run it. Um, so, so that's that case. And then the other thing that's happening in this science room and a number of them, these tables, as you see them, are bolted to the floor. <laughs> and I wish I could say they were bolted to the floor in nice straight rows, because they're not even straight rows. But, but again, there's just no flexibility. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't have the opportunity to push tables together and have a group of four working together or, or, or any of that type of thing. And, and also, I mean, they're pretty snugly put together, so <laughs> kids are sort of shimmying sideways to get to their space. So, so again, mm -hmm. antiquated, but also sort of immovable in a lot of ways. And then this picture here, um, I, I, you can all guess that? what that is. It's an air condition, a window air conditioning unit. Must be at winter time, so they've got it all taped up for keep it blowing in the cold out. But um, you know, air conditioning is much more common than it ever was before. <coughs> buildings again with the warmer swing seasons and the more common use of school buildings throughout the summer months for specialty programs and so on, it's just more common to have air conditioning. And you certainly would want them to be in your library, your computer labs, your administration, who is there all season, uh, all, all year long, and, and, and the like. So that's just an example of that. Um, you know, I, I, I could have showed images of, you know, acoustic problems and issues. Um, you know, I mean, there certainly is a lot of, a lot of um, known uh, understanding about how the acoustic treatment in the space helps or hinders learning and so on. Um, so that's technology and other features. There's just a, a, a wealth of things that older buildings just don't have and sometimes are hard to accommodate um, mm -hmm. without sort of a comprehensive renovation. Uh, the next one, adjacency and size. I, I, I found myself using the word adjacency over and over and over when I was talking with the, with the um, faculty. It matters. It matters what you're next to, how, how easily you can get to another space, what's around your space, how it all functions. And so in a lot of instances throughout the building, um, I put a, a, a picture here of um, well, it's a probably old-fashioned called the home ec it, with the family and consumer sciences, um, one of their spaces. And they've got several spaces and they're on multiple floors. And really in maybe an ideal world, that program would like to actually be near the preschool. I mean, there's a lot of things that ideally, if they were situated in a, in a better configuration, it would enhance um, how they teach and how the teachers, you know, able to work with each other. Um, up the upper left picture, um, as you can see, are five students that were told by their teacher, go find a space to sit and work on this project together. And they're in the stairwell. <laughs> and um, 
So again, with the changes of, of how we teach and how we learn, and maybe it's not how we learn it's changed, but it's how we teach to accommodate how we learn, um, there's, there's, there's a need for um, what we call either breakout space or small group rooms. Mm -hmm. And so it starts to get into the flexibility of, of the facility to have not only regular size classrooms, but smaller spaces and larger spaces because there's different ways to learn. And, and, and um, so you, as a teacher, you might want to say to your class, I want to break you up in groups and I want you to work on these things, you know, in a small group. But your classroom's a little too small, so if you broke them up in group, they're going to be sort of om almost on top of each other. So you make the decision, okay, go out and find a spot in the hallway. Um, but uh, ideally, there would be some small group breakout spaces for this to happen in. Um, they don't seem to mind, of course, but but again, it's, it's, it's thinking about that. Um, the the, the lower left, I, I spared you all pictures of the bathrooms. <laughs> I didn't want to get into that. So it's just a, um, a, the doorway to mm -hmm. one of the bathrooms. Um, we sort of did a rough count and a rough calculation. And again, not surprisingly, there's not enough of the mm -hmm. facilities you know, per today's code. But the other, the other well, there's a couple of different issues. The other issue is that they're not dispersed where you need them. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that has lent, lent itself to a lot in a lot of cases that whole downs building the bathrooms are at the f furthest far end of the corridor by themselves and I'm going to repeat the word by themselves as an issue because they're sort of not monitored you know not able to be easily monitored because they are like they're beyond the corridor doorways they're almost to the stairwell um, by themselves and that actually happens in this building too as you're all familiar with going around the corner here and um, I mean, it's, that's, that, that can be a big deal. I mean, it's, it's just, it's not an ideal situation. No, bathrooms don't want to be the middle of everything, but they want to have activity around them, so there's cause for others to be walking by and monitoring mm -hmm. um, what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and the upper right image is ju it's just a, a cramped classroom. So we already talked about square footage and size. You know, this is, this is actually one of the irregular classrooms. It's probably hard to tell on there, but it's actually got um, two smaller wings, one off to the upper part of the page and one to the mm -hmm. right part of the page. So they're kind of just unusable. In this case, in this room, um, it looks like the snowboarding club, <laughs> if you have one, or whatever they might be, there's a lot of tall things that look like snowboards to me um, <laughs> being stored in this corner. And, and you know, the, the, the teacher can't really teach in that corner. I mean, she can't get to those students anyway. So it, the, again, the desks are, you know, close together to the middle. Um, and again, it's the right size, and it's also the right location to each other. Another good example we were able to um, put in there has to do with, like, the music spaces. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have the auditorium on one floor and one, you know, band on another and chorus on another, and then the, the backdrop stage sets are being built somewhere else, and so the students are walking around with instruments up and down floors. And again, it's just, it's, like, it's part of the school day and everyone's used to it, but, you know, in a more modernized facility, you'd have a performing arts music mm -hmm. sort of grouping mm -hmm. all together. Um, so, uh, so space needs. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure the list is a lot longer than I got to when I, in just my brief time with the faculty and the <laughs> principals and everything, but um, we'll get there. So, so some of the, 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 the hottest topics were um, the upper right is the library. So not only is it a pass-through, but it also has obstructed view columns. Um, the lower right is a different group of kids, so you're, mm -hmm. you're aware that this happens in more than one case, and they chose the corridor floor, again, doing an assignment. Mm -hmm. um, so small group rooms, varied but variable size rooms and spaces. The left is the science classrooms. I think that um, mm -hmm. between the obstructions, the antiquated, and the overall size, and number of them, because surely one other solution is you keep them all that size and you build more of them mm -hmm. and you have smaller classes in those spaces so they're right sized for the number of students that are in those spaces. So again, there's a lot of different ways of accommodating it. In the upper left um, is lunchtime, <laughs> um, which was just daunting to me. There was, there was a whole slew of pictures um, of the kids, um, you know, sort of 
infiltrating at once. And um, again, you're all familiar, but the, the cafeteria is very unique in that it has a stairwell in the middle of it. <laughs> and mm. um, it's also, uh, you know, it's, it's open to other sort of spaces that want to be quiet during the day, you know? And we're actually a you know, big proponent of the cafeteria being a central sort of space, because otherwise it's only used for an hour and a half in the day, and then it's not really useful. Um, but at the same time, it needs to, when it's, what it's adjacent to, needs to not mind mm -hmm. the noise of the, of the lunch period and so on. Um, and, it, and because of that sort of obstruction in the middle, it's, it's, it's a task to monitor it, keep an eye on everybody when you've got, I don't know what the math is, if we've got 250 kids at lunch period or whatever the number is, it's a lot. So, um, so the next piece has to do with safety and security. Um, this one, um, we, we tried to identify, first of all, we circled and flagged mm -hmm. all the exterior doors. And we count 50 locations. And that's not 50 door swings. Mm -hmm. That's 50 locations. Mm -hmm. So say your front doors mm -hmm. on, and under the, under the columns, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. That's, that's not, that was sort of one location. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of doors. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, to the exterior in the building. Mm -hmm. And the red dots, um, we spent some time with the um, assistant principal and, <coughs> you know, where are your problem areas? Um, and the, the real key problem areas are stairwells, corridors, bathrooms. Mm -hmm. Those are like, you know, so if I just to lump them as, as three main um, uh, areas. And so what happens, in a stairwell, every stairwell has a top and a bottom and that aren't really busy and actively used mm -hmm. a lot. And mm -hmm. so kids can hang out. And uh, some stairwells more than others because some really are hardly ever used, um, but they, they, they have that capacity of, you know, if they're not heavily used and you can sort of tuck yourself, uh, the upper left here picture, you know, basically go down here, there's nothing happening, there's stops there, and I could, I could be down there all day, kind of a thing, unless somebody goes by, and why would someone go by, because the only thing down here, I think that's the boiler room. Um, the picture on the lower left is one, just one example of a circulation path that doesn't really have anything off of it. So it gets to point A, you know, from point A to point B, but there aren't classrooms and adults there off of that. And there's a number of those that wrap around the building. If I go back here, um, one, one big example is coming around, um, I always get lost on which floor I'm on, this thing. This is just a corridor that wraps around here, again, to get somewhere. But you know, and there's a lot of light and glass and, and all of that. And, um, but there's nobody there seeing what's going on or if people are hanging out or, or anything. Um, so the, the one on the right was the best picture I could come up with, but um, the, the PA system, mm -hmm. the public address system, the, the bells, if we're going to use the word bells, which I think is a very polite word for the jarring noise that happens between classrooms, the ability to communicate throughout the building, the fact that there's no phones in every single classroom, which is where they should be for communication and, and, and all of that. Um, so this, this, I believe, you know, was once upon a time the whole system and the <laughs> clocks has been moved elsewhere and that's a speaker and the heat and an electrical um, switch. But, um, you know, it, it's, you know, the, just the importance of being able to communicate, you know, the adults to be able to communicate throughout a building like this can't, can't be, you know, overstated. And the lower right, I'm back to the science again, not to be a harpy, but, but the, the issue of just um, creating a safe environment where you are using um, chemicals and, and, the, and the like, um, you know, that's just a very, you know, a focused issue. I think um, overall, um, let me flip the page here, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Um, you know, it, it is just a function of the overall mass and size of the building and its layout. I mean, there's, 
there's always multiple ways to monitor and to take care of things and all of that, and that happens throughout the school day. It's just, it's almost work, <laughs> you know, uh, on, on top of, you know, doing what you want to be doing, which is teaching the students. But um, there's a level of, of activity that needs to happen in this building. Um, I cite an example of, you know, basically the ability of, um, none of the exterior doors are on a security alarm system, so you have no way of knowing if a door is propped open. And so, lo and behold, they've been known to get propped open, and when the gym teacher comes back on a Monday morning, he can tell that people have been in the building over the weekend because, you know, one of the doors, one of the multitudes of doors had been propped open on a Friday, and they came in and hung out, and again, you know, teenagers will be teenagers. It's not really about that. It's the fact that the building, you know, needs to be better secured. I mean, all the doors lock, but again, it's a lot of doors to keep an eye on, and, um, Certainly in any uh, modernization or upgrade to the building, all the doors would be on a security alarm system. You'd know if a door wasn't locked. You wouldn't be able to alarm the system if it wasn't locked um, and shut. So I think I'm going to stop. The oh, no, I have one more. Sorry. It stuck with me for one more slide. This was just me trying to put some quick bullets. I mean, if you, if, you know, we know we have a building that's um, over 50 years old, over 80 years old, 100 years old. Just knowing those numbers, anyone would be able to assume the systems are old and the finishes are old and that things need to be updated. So whether it's uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, all of those types of systems. And over the years, things have happened and been updated little by little, accessible toilet room here and things like that. Um, but it's a, it's a big undertaking. and. Um, it's a lot of old equipment, and Kathy referenced mm -hmm. a couple boilers have been replaced, and this is an ongoing thing. Um, security upgrades, not the least of which, we're talking about mm -hmm. the, the doors and um, that type of thing. Technology upgrades, we've talked about, you know, the whole sort of building envelope, roof, windows, doors. Um, again, the energy efficiency of that, uh, when you have the older windows, especially these beautiful, massive, large ones which let in lots of light, but they're also not necessarily the most energy efficient windows, so a lot of heat is going out. Um, finishes, everything from, uh, you know, there's been various attempts to protect corridor walls, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily very successful, you know, so the walls are easily banged up. Um, you know, flooring, appropriate acoustic treatment in the spaces and on the ceilings. Mm -hmm. um, and then accessibility upgrades. Mm -hmm. We all know there's one elevator in the building. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get to every floor level. It certainly isn't convenient to every part of this large complex. Mm -hmm. A building of this size would, would have multiple um, elevators. Um, you know, and so on. So there's a lot of pieces to the accessibility from the auditorium seating to bathrooms and handrails and mm -hmm. all of that. Um, and I think that, uh, again, you've all had a chance probably to look at the on-site insight report. Um, what, what we try to do is um, um, explain what the on-site insight report is and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. And um, really, it's a, it's a tool mm -hmm. that is uh, very useful and very helpful for um, school facilities to think about and plan future expenditures. Um, it, it looks at sort of a 20-year cycle, and in year five you need to do this, and so on. It um, does not look at educational needs. It does not look like, stru like at structural implications. It does not look at a full-on accessibility <laughs> upgrades. Um, I tried to highlight in, in our report just some of the things that have been talked about and written about that is not covered. Um, it, it doesn't... It doesn't look at, I mean, you know, even in the report, it cites, it flags, you know, again, this is a very useful tool for, for mm -hmm. Mark and for Diane. It flags, you know, there's water infiltration, mm -hmm. so you might want to put a couple thousand dollars into investigating that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say it's going to cost X to fix it because no one knows what the X is. So, um, you know, it's just, it's, there needs to be a differentiation between um, this sort of, facilities maintenance tool and a full-on either renovation, renovation addition, new construction, looking at the whole complex as a in a feasibility study um, with the assistance of the state funding program and doing a project. So um, I think we wanted to 
be sure that we express that, it acknowledge all the work that was done in that and that it's useful for what it is for, um, but that the understanding is that it's, it's a very small piece and it doesn't really get at a lot of other things that, um, I mean, I guess my, my sense is if I was spending $30 million, I'd want to think that you were really getting somewhere. And if it really isn't getting anywhere, what does it take to get somewhere? And look at this complex, which is at the heart of Arlington, mm -hmm. and think about it in terms of what, you know, what can I do now that's good for 50 years? And it's possible. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's what you want to be looking at. Mm -hmm. And certainly, we can see that buildings stand for longer than 50 years since we're in one. Mm -hmm. And then and I know mm -hmm. we have just one slide that just touches upon enrollments. Mm -hmm. Diane wants to give a um, in terms of the enrollment, um, you've seen you've seen other iterations of this enrollment sheet, and it mm -hmm. too is in the doc for those watching at home. It is among the documents on the high school building. Um, what I've done is, you know, uh, we we use a five-year weighted average to see how many children progress from one grade to the next. And we use the most recent history of the last five years to inform what we think mm -hmm. is going to happen into the future. Um, I've taken those projections. Typically, I only do them forward in time for, four, for five years because mm -hmm. that's all the birth information I have. Mm -hmm. um, they aren't born yet past five years into the future. But in this case, since we're thinking about the high school, I took the children that either are already in our schools or are already born and living in town and use the existing numbers to push forward into time. And as you see, as we roll forward in time, the much larger class sizes we're enjoying in the elementary school are rolling their way up into the high school. And if we're feeling cramped at where we are today with <sighs> 1254, when we start hitting 1600 down the road, and, and this isn't this isn't as speculative as trying to guess what our kindergarten class will look like in 10 years. These are children that are here, either in the schools or living in town, not yet ready for school. So these numbers, to me, feel less speculative. I mean, it's hard to say what will happen, your, your future casting. But I feel like the, we have to take very seriously the, what it's going to mean when all the kids at the elementary schools start colliding with these much, much larger classes. I mean, by classes, I mean cohorts going through a grade rather than in a teacher, in groups in front of a teacher. I should probably call them cohorts, so I will. <laughs> All right, I, back to that. So, so we're open to questions. Any questions from the committee members? Mr. Hainer. I just heard a number that you threw, a dollar figure. Mm -hmm. which you said $30 million. That's the that's that's the inside 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 report. Report. I know, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. It was thirty million in regular want, and thirty million in I, green. I just want to make sure that the public knows that, that that we're not building a brand new high school for thirty million dollars. Mm -hmm. I want to make that clear. Yes. That's all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you want her excuse me, do you want her to talk a little bit about her experience in uh, Cambridge? these kind of projects? Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Yeah. That would be yeah. my yeah. question. Yeah. So yeah. Exactly. Okay. I uh, <coughs> preface it by saying that HMFH was the architectural form, firm that did the renovation and some additions at Cambridge Ridge and Latin. Mm -hmm. wow. And that was just completed in what, 11? <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I tried to, in the report, use sort of the two examples. Um, mm -hmm. One, I went to the uh, MSBA's database of work that's been completed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, monkeyed around with it a little bit because it's all been it's old numbers and, you know, there's escalation and construction cost um, changes. And also the fact that I don't know what was done on those projects. So I can't directly compare and say, this is mm -hmm. a scope that's similar to, because mm -hmm. I, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just, just doing what I did, and again, I have a whole paragraph in here to try to explain what my, my math was mm -hmm. all about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about $100 million. That's, that's just, and again, I don't know what I'm comparing it to exactly, but at least it says this is on average what's happening in school buildings in the last, you know, five years or whatever it's been that MSBA's been keeping their records, six years. Um, so that was, that was one, one sort of example. And then um, I was able to be more specific um, in terms of I know what was done at Cambridge Ridge and Latin, um, 
and taking those square footage. Now at Cambridge Ridge and Latin, um, the bones of the building was, was in good shape. And it's, again, a solid building. And again, very similar to you all. They weren't just going to go up and move somewhere else in a different part of Cambridge. There was no place for them to go. Um, and uh, we renovated it. Uh, it was uh, 400,000 square feet. Um, in earlier phases, we'd renovated their field house and their war, the war memorial. Um, and so that's different square footage. And we did not. Um, you know, rearrange spaces and reconfigure anything. It was more the, the roof and the windows, mechanical upgrades, lighting upgrades, um, uh, some, you know, uh, fixtures and things like that in terms of, um, like, science rooms. Um, I think that's one of the main things we did do, and actually, as far as any space configuration, we took we took walls down in between two spaces to make better sized science classrooms. Um, but uh, and so in that case, you know, I would say that you were getting closer. And again, in comparing to that type of scope, more like 110 million dollars. And again, that's just assuming you're going to start a project any day now, which you know that's all to be determined. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, and it's also, you know, not knowing, you know, the, the, all the comparisons of reimbursement rates and all of that. So there's a whole lot of other numbers and stuff to go in there. Um, you know, I, I felt comfortable, and again, you know, it's, it's <coughs> don't shoot the messenger, as the saying goes, mm -hmm. because anybody in my position would be coming up with these round numbers for digestion and all of that. Um, but that, you know, you easily could be anywhere between 90 and 130 million. And, you know, I don't, you know, what could happen beyond that, it all depends. It depends on when the project happens, what the scope is, what the decisions and are. Cool. And the thing that you need to know is that one of the main things you do when you first start the project in the feasibility study phase is you look at all the different options and you look at all the different numbers and you're able to see and compare the difference between if we do this, it costs X, and this is what the end result is. And, you know, and that, that is the time when you sort of have the decision-making process that says, you know, where are we comfortable in the dollar? Where are we comfortable with what our end result is mm -hmm. and what we have for a facility moving forward? Um, and so, you know, I think that it's just, it's, it's a range. I mean, we all know that Newton North costs $200 million. So, I mean, no one should be too shocked that there's big numbers out there. And Newton North is not a bigger facility than this one. You know, so, so um, I wish I had off the top of my head, I can't remember what, what's happening at Concord Carlisle, because they've got a big high school, too. And I don't know what their number is these days. It, it, it stopped and started. But anyway, so, uh, you know, and, and we were just talking about, is it Winchester's? <laughs> no, yeah. I they're doing one. You know, so, I mean, the examples are all around. I think that um, uh, it is, it's, you know, it, it may sound trite. It's an investment. Mm -hmm. This is, this is it. This is your high school. And, um, you know, you can keep putting small amounts of money on it and mm -hmm. to it and toward it and over the years. But I will tell you that you can spend that smaller amount of money, but MSBA is not going to help you with that. Mm. You're not going to get support from the state funding agencies to do that. They want to put their money, which of course is all of our money, but the money that they're in control of putting out there, they want to put it towards what they believe is a good investment. Mm -hmm. And that's why they have you go through all the steps with the feasibility mm -hmm. study. Mm -hmm. And they're, in, you know, they're on board with you, that's, and they'll agree with you that mm -hmm. says, yes, that's the best choice. That's how you should use your money. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to we use the percentage that we had at at Thompson, which is, should be similar, and with a, um, the 52 percent reimbursement and so on, um, you know, again, it's not exactly 50-50, but uh, if the state's going to give you half of something, mm -hmm. they're going to make sure that they believe it's a good investment and that you're putting the money where you should be and that you, the outcome is mm -hmm. that you're not going to come back to them knocking on their door in 15 years that you need something else. They'll think mm. Arlington High School is all set. We don't have to worry about that project for the f mm. indefinite future, right? And so that's really what they're thinking about. They don't want to just give you money to do patchwork things. Mm. They just they won't do that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bill and then Mr. Slipper. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. Jeff. Great. Good to see you again, Laurie. Laurie and I worked together on the Thompson project. 
The question I have is, you know, first of all, the 90 to 100 million, 130 million dollar figure, very preliminary. I, I think mm -hmm. anyone watching, don't get hung yep. up on any number. Mm -hmm. Don't. Yep. Don't get attached to any number because it will change many times. And as you said, we went through a feasibility process with the Thompson. There were multiple options out there. We settled on one that we could afford. Uh, <clears throat> my question to you is based on what you've seen in this high school and based on your experience with the MSBA, could you give us a sense of our chances of having a successful SOI with the, with the MSBA? Um. With I'm not asking a handicap, but just basically. Yeah, I mean, what, what happens? What happens with the MSBA each year is that they look at everything that's mm -hmm. there, and so, you know, your 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 chances, you know, are variable depending on who else is put in and what their problems are, mm -hmm. and and so that's what you're seeing. I mean, I think it's is it Watertown or Waltham? One Waltham, of them. Waltham. You know, ha had difficulty, and so it's not to say that they don't have needs. I, 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 I can almost guarantee you MSBA is not looking at them and saying, oh, you don't have any problem. We don't have to worry about you. It's sort of saying in comparison to the other 25 school buildings we're looking at mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. worse off for whatever reason, enrollments, facility condition, whatever the case may be. Um, so, so that's something that I, I really I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think in terms of um, its condition, it's not the worst building in the system, but it's not in great shape. In terms of enrollment, you have an expected enrollment growth that you're going to have to manage. Um, in terms of the educational needs, which, you know, keep in mind, MSBA is strong supporter of making sure that you solve the educational needs. You have plenty. So, um, I mean, I think you have a very good chance of being you know, in, in put in the system. And again, I, I have no way of predicting. So, and I think that, you know, it's a matter of if not this year, you go back next year. I mean, that's, that's what everybody has to do. Mm -hmm. um, so My next question is the time frame. Tonight we adopt mm -hmm. language for the SOI. Correct. And then we, we approve, we take a vote. Don't we have to take a vote tonight to? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you could take a vote tonight. It's, we mm -hmm. talked about last meeting. We're, we're written the SOI, mm -hmm. and we're certainly inviting comment on it. Um, but there is a very specific mm -hmm. language that you must uh, approve. Mm -hmm. The only issue with the particular language um, is what the date of submission is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, we know our the latest you can, you can put it in their, their system is April 11th. Now, we debated a little bit earlier whether we could say, you know, put the date in later, amend it. You could do something where you wait on the specific language and you basically do sort of a, a, a vote of support for where we're going. But you could also do the language tonight, and if we, I put in the motion uh, March 26th, that could be amended at a different meeting if that wasn't going to be a specific date that we put it in. You know, we have to, in order to submit a statement of interest to MSBA, mm -hmm. not only does the school committee have to approve mm -hmm. the language, mm -hmm. but the Board of Selectmen <coughs> does as well. And they're going to hear Lori's presentation, mm -hmm. our sort of collective overview of this on Monday. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that they're going mm -hmm. to schedule a vote on the 24th mm -hmm. of March after they have a chance to take all the materials. They're, they're getting your, your large packet tomorrow mm -hmm. and their packet as well. So they'll have a chance over the weekend to take a look at it. But they probably want to spend a little more time on that than that. So we do have some time on this. So, so, so don't confuse the two mm -hmm. things. There's language we vote, and in the language, mm -hmm. We indicate what are the priorities that we're submitting mm -hmm. this for, and we're mm -hmm. submitting it for four of the seven possible mm -hmm. uh, priorities. Mm -hmm. Mr. Well, just just oh. to let me finish the, the okay. train of thought. So I don't want to preempt the discussion, the conversation, the questions of Lori, but <clears throat> so we could vote this tonight. Mm -hmm. You could vote this tonight. Okay. With the possibility of amending mm -hmm. that one date later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, I don't think that's a big deal. But mm -hmm. the other question I have is. Could you just explain to the public and the committee that once the SOI is submitted, mm -hmm. how long, what's the time frame for a response? Well, I've come to understand that they may make a decision fairly soon within about a month, I think, only because they're having a meeting 
in, later in May for people who've been accepted for next year. Mm -hmm. But so I think we'll know fairly quickly. And then you go into a 270-day period, or up to 270 days, in which there's a number of requirements that you have to fulfill <coughs> in that 270 days. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you go into the next phase. And Lori has been through all of these as mm -hmm. well, as we have been in, in Thompson. It's a very prescribed mm -hmm. process that you go through that have time strengths on it and things you need to accomplish in those periods of time. One of which, in that next 270, is um, securing the funds for, to do the feasibility study. Mm -hmm. And I, I, w I don't know what the dollar amount would be on that. would be something we'd have mm -hmm. to, to look at what that would be. Um, probably, mm -hmm. I would guess, maybe in the million dollar area about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> that, did I completely answer yep, you got it? Mr. Schlick. Okay, uh, I, I want to go down two paths here. The first path is, okay, so the state says, yeah, this, this seems like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, you mentioned the difficulty of doing a building while we're running school. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a lot of room on this site to, to go beyond the present footprint of the building. Can you give us a sense of what the construction would actually look like if we did a major rebuild renovation mm -hmm. and how we'd manage to run school <coughs> in that situation? Um, so, uh, you know, again, that will be part of the feasibility study mm -hmm. because it has to be feasible, mm -hmm. meaning not only financially and good end result, but that you actually can accomplish it during the time frame that it needs to be accomplished mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, so certainly occupied site mm -hmm. construction, it's, it's not unheard of, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I can give you the example at Cambridge Ridge and Latin, mm -hmm. they fortunately had a building, the ninth grade mm -hmm. lived elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so that they were able to mm -hmm. move around and do it in don't ask me how many phases off the top of my head, but a number of mm -hmm. chunks and phases. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's an example of a full-on renovation and an urban, you know, snug site mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of kids. And so, you know, what, what happens when you're looking in the feasibility phase, and it, it, it always surprises people, but um, multiple phased occupied site mm -hmm. renovations take longer so your escalation and your costs go up. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you're going to start to see when mm -hmm. you start to compare different scenarios and options mm -hmm. for the work. Um, so it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. It needs to be managed. It needs to be planned mm -hmm. for, you know, incrementally every step of the way so mm -hmm. everyone knows what they're getting into. Um, and so how it would be done on this site would, would need to be now. determined. Mm -hmm. um, whether some, pro some program vacates the site a grade vacates the site. Um, an addition happens somewhere, and then something else is demolished, mm -hmm. and nope. people move over there's to the addition. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. you know, we, again, we went through this on Thompson, mm -hmm. because um, at the early stages of Thompson, there was no place for the kids to go. Mm -hmm. And so our initial, again, a, a, a many, <laughs> fewer, fewer amount of, of, of students to worry about. But same idea. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how would we do this mm -hmm. if they were here? Um, so it is, it's just a, it's an added step in the process, but it would have to, it have to be done. Because again, you know, you're not going to up and leave the site and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. As far as I can tell, um, that's not feasible. Um, you know. We don't have a lot of somewhere else. Exactly. I'm, I'm thinking we'd end up demolishing a part of a building that doesn't have a lot of classrooms and build a, an intensive and classroom wing in that section of the school and around. rotate it around that way. It, it's just the way I look at it logistically. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert. I don't do that for a living. Uh, the, the, other th the other question we're, we're being hit with is we're also taking a look at enrollment projections and getting nervous about the middle school. Mm -hmm. And people have asked me, uh, could we come in with an 8 through 12 school? Mm -hmm. uh, would that be feasible and looked at by the uh, state as a possibility to solve two problems? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that has happened in other communities. Um, because the way you said it, it's exactly how they would think of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. They're not going to be knocking on my door for the middle school next mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. do, do you know what I mean? Like, again, yep. they want you to be looking mm -hmm. at your whole system and being comprehensive mm -hmm. so that when they do give you money, it's solving mm -hmm. what needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, you don't have to say that that's exactly what you're doing, but, you know, grade reconfiguration mm -hmm. um, or restructuring is certainly a common um, element to look at in the feasibility study. Mm -hmm. Or an outcome that comes later. So the state's pretty opinionated on what we can do. Um, well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're well, I mean, but they're, you know, again, they're, they're, they're looking at yeah. the money that's coming out of their pocket and making sure it's the right way. Same, same way you all are. Mm -hmm. So again, um, if it's the right way, it's the right way. I mean, everybody will mm -hmm. agree. I mean, I haven't, I haven't worked on a project yet where the community is kicking and screaming, I don't want to do this project. I mean, it just doesn't work yeah. that. I mean, right. you know, ultimately, uh, the best, most logical, responsible thing to do mm -hmm. prevails. Um, yeah, the, only, the, the thing is, is that, you know, at this point, people are asking, what are we going to do? What, what's what's going to look like? What's the disruption going to be? What's going to happen? And we don't have the answer because we have to entice the state by presenting a need statement. And that's essentially what we're doing. Right, step one. It, mm -hmm. Step one is demonstrating the needs. And it's not until they say, yes, you have a need mm -hmm. and we need and we will help you that we can actually start thinking about what we might do to solve the need. So we're saying and yes. No one can help themselves from starting to think about it earlier. I mean, that's what you yeah. all do. I mean, mm -hmm. you're all in, you're all, you know, you're knee deep in all of this. And of mm -hmm. course you're going to mm -hmm. think about it. But again, it's, it's doing it in that sort of full methodical way. And, you know, it becomes sort of, you know, initial steps about this do mm -hmm. really look like a brainstorming session. Well, what about, what about, what about? I mean, that's, again, you have to start sort of thinking about everything and then narrow it to the more appropriate choices and yeah the point is the state wants to be in the whatabouts because when we did five of our elementaries and the middle school it was under the old rules where we decided what we wanted to do put it in an application wait for it to come top of the list it would be automatically funded at the 63 percent have a nice life so the process is very different and that, that's just something important for everybody mm -hmm who's been through previous uh, debt exclusions and building projects to really understand. Yeah, good point, yeah. yeah. Other members? Ms. Heim? Um, I just wanted to thank you for the presentation because as one of the many parents in this community that has actually sit in that triangle room on parent nights mm -hmm. and um, raced up three flights and across the bridge that goes past the auditorium where nobody does see you and hope that we were arriving at the right floor at the right time. <laughs> um, there are a lot of rooms we sat in. We couldn't, we couldn't see the instructor. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something that is dire for our children. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so you really captured that need well. Um, I, I obviously want to give Dr. Allison Ampey a chance to um, talk as well, but I'm wondering if there is anything from preventing us from forwarding this at this point because it does still need the selectmen's mm -hmm. vote and if we push this off to another meeting um, it seems like we'd only set the timeline back even mm -hmm. further uh, th there wouldn't be yeah. a, a timeline issue there mm -hmm. they can be done separately you could do it after this board of selectmen they just need to and the approval of the language from both mm -hmm. entities mm -hmm. there's nothing to prevent you from voting this tonight and still continue to improve the SOI. Mm -hmm. You don't have, because you, you have the first draft. I think it's a pretty complete draft because one of the, one of the things we did learn from MSBA in this process is that they prefer to have you quote the experts. Mm -hmm. um, now there's some parts of it that we, we did our, you know, obviously wrote um, ourselves, but to the extent that we could quote that that matched the question uh, we did and also you'll find because what we will uh, a lot of people will probably start reading this when you have four priorities some of the questions are the same so you find that you there's a lot of repetition and that's just the way it is because somebody could put in a application for one priority mm -hmm. and they're gonna touch mm -hmm. on the same issues as well that are relevant to that particular priority so the so the SOI could still be improved, but it doesn't prevent you from uh, making a motion tonight 
and voting to have this, um, the SOI submitted by the deadline of April 11th to the, the uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority. And what were you, you were saying about the priorities? Um, out of the eight priorities. Seven. seven. The seven there's, priorities. There's eight priorities. Oh, there's eight there's priorities. Eight, Sorry. Uh, there's eight, eight priorities that, just, that we have the potential to select. That's correct. Oh, um, yeah, there are eight. Mm -hmm. I look at four of them as if we select one of them, you can't select the other three. For instance, mm -hmm. if we're looking towards future overcrowding, you can't select existing. No, you can you can you can you can, you can select any that are applicable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we felt that you know we went with the the ones that we felt were solid and most strong. Mm -hmm. Priority three: prevention of loss of accreditation. Priority four: prevention of severe overcrowding expected to result from increased enrollments. Priority five. Replacement, renovation, or modernization of school facility systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating, and ventilation systems to increase energy conservation and decrease energy-related costs in a school facility, which I'd really love to see happen. And priority seven, replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements. Mm -hmm. um, so in essence, though, as a result of this presentation, if we wanted to, we also could then um, select priority one which says that there is flaws in the condition, the circulation of unmonitored areas that mm -hmm. are affecting the safety of our students. Certainly or the safety, yeah. Safety part of that is definitely. I mean, which mm -hmm. is perhaps not as mm -hmm. compelling as some of the other priorities in terms mm -hmm. of the level of safety being affected. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not an unsafe school, but mm -hmm. any place in the world having children in a place that they're not being mm -hmm. monitored I have to admit, I, when I looked at it, when I think of health and safety, I think of roofs falling down and, you know, asbestos dripping off the walls and, you know, I think of a different level of safety. I did not consider egress and, you know, lack of supervision in the same, I just didn't consider it in the same realm of safety. I don't think we have as strong an argument. I think the four we've selected, we have a really strong argument for each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. Right, but, uh, but I would also venture to mm -hmm. say the definition of health and safety mm -hmm. prior to what happened in Newtown, and this is the definition of health and safety mm -hmm. today, are a little bit different because when we hear about doors being left open, mm -hmm. that really is a bit more compelling. Mm -hmm. it, the condition of our uh, science labs as well, uh, if a, some of those experiments take, actually took place in some of those rooms, mm -hmm. the ventilation mm -hmm. is inadequate. If a child did something inappropriate, the safeguards of, uh, of mm -hmm. the shower or the eye wash may not be there. I, mm. You know more about this, Diane, than we do. Uh, mm -hmm. We're just bringing it up. We're not trying to pack the list, I think. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we can get as much in there as we can. What, why don't we, um, why don't we get this confirmed from MSBA? Okay. Um, there's certainly plenty of, mm -hmm. you've seen in the programmatic analysis that mm -hmm. speak to the health and safety. I must admit that when I, I really saw that too as something really dire in terms of um, the building is falling down. Yeah, but on the other hand, well, but it does say or structurally unsound or in a condition seriously jeopardizing health and safety. Yeah. We actually have had chunks of the ceiling fall down. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> small, <laughs> small little pieces. So well, far, yeah, but we should, we should. But anyway, we'll, part the you know what we can do? Here. Let me look at that. Mm -hmm. And if we'll we decide, you know, after talking with them, they think that this is, would fit what they had in mind yeah, as well. Yeah, what, is, what are they mm -hmm. thinking on that? We yeah. could mm -hmm. um, certainly, there's plenty in our mm -hmm. information here to, to answer those questions. So to that extent, you could vote what we have tonight if you wanted to, and we could amend it, or you could wait until next week. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if everybody's going to be here, and you may all want to have the opportunity but to But I do thought the vote was not about the actual SOI, but about submitting the But you have yeah. to state which uh, priorities your uh, priorities. Dr. Allison mm -hmm. So, yes, if we're, I'm going to touch on a few things. First, if we're talking about possibly adding something, I think we should just take, make a motion that we support the submission of an SOI and plan on voting the exact language later mm -hmm. um, because we don't want to get that wrong. Um, 
Yeah, when I look at that, when I read structurally unsound, I mean, mm -hmm. to me, that's kind of the key point. And if mm -hmm. that's what they're thinking, then it won't. But I like your idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and, I, yeah. and I think that yeah. maybe what we want to make sure is that mm -hmm. throughout the ones that we are doing, those points are being made. Mm -hmm. Right. Do, do you exactly. know what I mean? You know, as opposed to just not being made, they're being made regardless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they certainly are. I mean, those points that, that, of, of egress and lack of supervision and poor mm -hmm. circulation mm -hmm. are made throughout the four priorities mm -hmm. we've already put in. So I would actually, that's where I'm not sure when we're going to talk about the actual SOI as opposed to the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, because I think mm -hmm. some of these points can be made stronger mm -hmm. than they are. Um, but first, I had a couple questions just about the presentation and, and about your study, um, just for facts. What, what is the design capacity of the high school? Um, did I do that? I can easily get that number for you. I mean, taking all square footage, assuming all other programs well, are gone. And well, yeah. I'm, I just want to, you know, when, when can we say we're overcrowded? I mean, I know we are kind of now, but I mean, design capacity, usage. I don't think, was a hundred years ago concept mm -hmm. in terms of, but, you know, and the, the utilization of the buildings changed over time. Yeah. Right. But I'm saying we should, we need to be able to say when we're going to be overcrowded. And based on, you know, in other words, based on the classrooms we have and the size of the cafeteria we have? Yeah, something. Yeah. Or based uh, on it, the it, rooms that had pieces of ceiling, ceiling fall that we don't <coughs> utilize now and so those students are in other locations. Yeah. Right. Or the rooms that have no windows and just, all of that, just take those off the table. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I'm just, mm -hmm. you know, because I know how many students we can have at Audison and we're going to be over that mm -hmm. in a year or two. And I'd like to know where we're at with the high school and I really don't quite know. Well, um, it's, it's a difficult, I think it's a difficult question to answer, and Lori might disagree or have a, for the thoughts on it, because only 23% mm -hmm. of our classrooms meet the minimum mm -hmm. square footage. Mm -hmm. So when they talk about design mm -hmm. capacity in a building, they're usually classrooms that are within those ranges mm -hmm. of class size for 23 students. I think it would be fine to use the MSBA criteria and try and figure out a way to fudge it, you know, to, to follow as closely as we can to their criteria to figure out what our capacity is. Never mind what we're actually put, stuffing into these classrooms, but to figure out where we're at because that's what, those are the numbers that they're going to be looking at. And I mean, we can, you can ask them for, how do we, assign numbers to classrooms which are below your your size do we do it on a students per square foot or do we just put 23 students into this and say it's overcrowded um, but I just I think we want that number um, or, or at least our best guess at it and in line with this I'm also wondering if in your studies or anyone else's studies how much of the space that the town or other programs that could potentially be put elsewhere could be used as classroom space if, if they were moved out mm -hmm. and because I, I think that's another question if we're talking we're worried about being overcrowded mm -hmm. it's just going to come up mm -hmm. and we need an answer um, and my suspicion is that an awful lot of the space that's being used by other programs um, is not really useful for classroom space or is not, you know, either it's too small or it's in the wrong spot or it doesn't have the right mm -hmm. e en mm -hmm. entrances and ex exits and things like that. Um, but again, I think these are things people are going to want to know. Um, so, but... But then the other thing is just when are we going to talk about the SOI or do you just want us all to forward our comments yes. to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Karen to Sony. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. I put that okay. in the memo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you all yeah, that's all for now. Okay. Uh, just a few more brief comments, uh, Mr. Hainer and Mr. Schlickman. You, mm -hmm. you mentioned we have 400,000 uh, square feet, yet mm -hmm. in your presentation, the educationally, were you utilizing approximately 200,000 square feet? Mm -hmm. The spaces that we use and the, and the way this building, the buildings are configured, I, as a former educator, 
in the tours that I've been in, it really bothered me, the triangular rooms and things of that mm -hmm. nature, and I appreciate that. Is that a factor? Should we be, t uh, that if, if theoretically we have 200,000 square feet that is not educational, mm -hmm. does MSBA look at that? Um, I mean, I think, again, in the feasibility study, you'll be analyzing the whole building. Okay. And you'll be analyzing, not unlike what you're referring to, but mm -hmm. also, um, you know, they're, they're going to have to be big decisions on are we going to continue to be part of the lab collaborative? Because mm -hmm. that's a commitment that you have made, and then therefore you need to provide space for it. And MSBA will understand that. I mean, they, you know what I mean? A lot of the stuff is very logical thinking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's it's looking at what's what's here. I mean, your preschool program is here. Um, you're not going to not have a preschool program in, in town. So where would it go if it wasn't here? So there's going to be a lot. You know, you, you're it's it's a very um, you're a very unique situation with what you have happening here, and decisions need to be made. And I think that um, it's it's logical in my mind and having done a lot of these and worked with the MSBA mm -hmm. for some time, um, that they'll want to see it both ways. Mm -hmm. All just high school, everything's gone. That's your problem where it goes, mm -hmm. right? What happens? You know, and, and we need to be able to um, defend what needs to be here and why. Um, mm -hmm. We need to um, be able to show scenarios, different scenarios of how the building would lay out, where things would be, what would be the more optimal location for things. Okay, if they're mm -hmm. going to be here, where can they be that maybe they don't interrupt the high school programs and the high school program can work better and be located in a better situation. So um, again, that's all part of really rolling up your sleeves and being part of the feasibility mm -hmm. study is looking at and analyzing the building buildings in this case you know the whole complex mm -hmm. and and how the spaces might work so it really is sort of saying okay we're throwing everything out the window what you have now what 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 are the physical constraints and opportunities in this complex and go from there mm -hmm. and see how it could best be laid out um, and again at the same time there's going to be you know, town and other people sort of going, well, what if and what if on their end because, you know, we might come up with something and they say, well, that's a great idea, but we've got no place to put that, so it has to stay there. And, um, you know, that, that's, just, that's just part of the thinking. I mean, if you all recall, we had certainly a, mm. a good stab at putting the preschool over at Thompson, you know. So, again, it has to be somewhere. And um, so, so those are all part of the thinking. I think it's, it's, there's not one way to do it absolutely not going to be one way to do it. It'll just be the best way when end, end result. All so. right. Finish up this conversation. I'm, I'm listening to Dr. Allison Anthony's question, and, and I just want to hone in on that. When we put in the statement of interest, and we say we have a 400,000 square foot facility, and we've got 1,200 kids, and we're citing overcrowding, is this going to put us at a disadvantage, or we're going to have to explain that something going to happen, or will we... Uh, be able to move forward by uh, somehow documenting that there's so much unusable space in the building because of the design of the building. Is, is something in the SOI going to need to mm -hmm. flag that mathematical discrepancy? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that would be mm -hmm. certainly worthwhile. I mean, you're not going to be able to fully explain it. I mean, we haven't done yeah. enough to fully explain it. Um, but I think acknowledging it is is certainly um, understandable, and I think that it's not it's not that unique that you have other programs in your space. It's not like MSBA has never seen it before, so they're going to sort of deduce that something else is going on, and and that's part of again the process once it gets going. But I think your point of saying, you know, make sure to let them know. Listen, mm -hmm. this is the situation. This is the condition. There's a lot of spaces that are unusable, period, for education. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those spaces are now being used by the town, you know, for storage mm -hmm. and things like that. And sort of give sort of a, a brief mm -hmm. outline. Mm -hmm. uh, we put some square footages to the different yeah. programs that are here, mm -hmm. clearly saying we have a lab collaborative program. We have mm -hmm. a preschool program. This is where they reside. We have administration. This is where it resides. Yeah. And I think the, I think the thing that you all and the town collectively needs to be open to is we don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. in four years from now, this might not be the school committee room. Mm -hmm. You might be somewhere else. I mean, that, I mean, that's how you sort of, 
and it, it is hard for all of us that are educated mm -hmm. and know too much about the building mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that because you already formulate ideas but you have mm -hmm. to go into the feasibility mm -hmm. study process with mm -hmm. anything's possible to figure out the best way to do it yeah. and and there's going to be the pushing back and forth between things and ultimately uh, you come up with the four things that have to be this way and you have to start getting those four things because otherwise you'd have no parameters but it's it's being open in the beginning and then then coming up with the parameters this has been an excellent presentation oh. I, I i think that if the msba gets the sense of what you told us tonight mm -hmm. we've got to come rise toward the top of their list because i you know i've been in some of the other buildings that they're doing mm -hmm. and I think our needs are just so substantial compared to some of the other schools that are getting funded okay. right now. Ms. Johnson. I just uh, wanted to respond to Mr. Schlickman. <laughs> All of these reports that you have in front of you will go in with the SOI. Mm -hmm. So they will have her report, mm -hmm. they will have um, the on-site insight report. Mm -hmm. They won't, it, the statement of interest is not the only information they'll it's receive. A, it's essentially a cover sheet and we're sending them the document. The, the, Precisely. With so the, they will, they will the have, with the diagrams and, the, and they will have the, the whole discussion the of this. Yep, and the yep. triangles. They're and getting, they get all of that and in fact they encourage us to attach all of that. Excellent. Thank you. Quick, quick question. Um, is there a square footage per student that they generally recommend for a high school level? They're used to being. Okay. They're I didn't know if that's how they, they figured they, it they, out or it's, if they. It's different now. Um, I mean, I could come up with a range because basically um, they used to say that. They used to say X number of square foot per student, so you could just do your math. Because right, I know like when we, when we. But now it's more great. Yeah, but in the past it was like that. It's more, um, there's more of a gradation to it. Sure. And so um, you start off with their um, program template, mm -hmm. the space program template of all the different spaces and needs mm -hmm. and l there's you know there's a column for here's your existing there's a columns in the middle for what you might propose you know we need 10 science not eight you know whatever that might be but the column on the right is their program and all you get to do on that column is on the bottom is you plug in the number of students and it populates the whole column and off to the right of that this is just an excel sheet this little teeny number that happens to tell you what the square footage is per but it changes so if i go up or down with the number of students that that percentage that per square foot number changes so it used to be huh. an easy thing to be able to tell you but it, it changes okay you know, they do different I know factoring about how many how big your cafeteria is how many lunch programs you have i mean there's it's a whole okay. formula that they've developed so okay I, d I know that when with certain other programs like our after school <coughs> programs when they are accredited they have to meet you know I don't know it's some random you know 35 square foot per student in the program they have to have for the program space so I just wondered if the state had a similar yeah, yeah. you know high school students need 150 square feet That's because on average you need this many and things that, and, that, or, and that was how it was and it's just whatever. it's just gotten a little more finite now okay yeah. all right thank you Dr. Allison Abbott I also had one other question, again, wondering if you've run across this as you've done your study. Um, part of the SOI asks about site issues, and I think the answer that we said was no, but I'm wondering about Mill Brook, which I think runs somewhere underneath the ground, very close to the high school or mm -hmm. under the high school, um, and Pierce Field is not school land, right? It's no, it, it's ours, but it's a remediation site. It's okay, so it's yeah. not able to be built yeah. on. Wouldn't so it be that, better to build a school on it than play football on it? I, I'm just saying yeah, that, yeah, but that comes up in feasibility. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. okay. Um, the, then yeah. the other one was just the red gym I heard was Safe. was also, a, Why? it was like something's capped and, and, and it can't be destroyed or built yeah. over. So, yeah. and that's I'm all just stuff like that would come up with feasibility. Concrete and okay, so it's it not. Anymore. I just want to get a sense see. from the committee if, if the committee thinks itself ready to uh, vote um, the language that was presented to us tonight, or if we want to see if, for example, Ms. Himes' statement about safety could be incorporated as a priority within. Um, is that the sense that I'm getting from the committee? I think Kathy should check out that. I do too. I, I think you can report to the Board of Selectmen that we're going to vote for this. Well, yes. we'll look it up tomorrow. Yeah, so we'll just we get know back. by Monday to tell them as well. I wish we could have voted it because I would have liked to have voted it before they vote it. Well, you know, we could vote it, and if we amend and add number one, we can re vote it. Yep. So I, w I would propose that we vote it tonight 
and and if we need to amend the the guts of it or amend the date, we can revote it uh, on the last meeting of the month. I'll so the let me go and do I have to read the entire motion or yeah. should I just? You should read the motion. Okay, I move that we resolve having uh, we pass a motion as follows: resolved having convened in an open meeting on March 6, 2014. The Arlington School Committee of the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, in accordance with its charter bylaws and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest <coughs> form dated March 26, 2014 for the Arlington High School, located at 869 Massachusetts Avenue, Arlington, Massachusetts, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which the application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Priority three, prevention of the loss of accreditation. Priority four, prevention of severe overcrowding expected to result from increased enrollments. Priority five, replacement, renovation, or modernization of school facility systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating and ventilation systems to increase energy conservation and decreased energy related costs in a school facility. Priority seven, replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting the statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits to the city or, or, or to the school district filing the application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building authority. Second. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Abstentions? Okay, 7 0. Mm -hmm. That passes. Any further discussion on this topic, Dr. Bodie? No. I, I want to thank uh, Lloyd Coles. Thank you for a terrific presentation. And uh, then our trial run here this evening will we'll be talking with the Board of Selectmen on Monday. And thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a good night. <laughs> thank you. You too. Have a great night. Good to see thank you. you very much. If we have no further business, I'd like to entertain a motion to move into executive session to conduct strategy sessions and preparations for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union which in hell in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares as exiting only for the purposes of adjournment. So moved. So, second. Okay. Roll call. Aye. 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 Aye.